Thank you so much for having us. I'm picturing being in the back room of Books Are Magic. I can like see the street outside. I'm gonna take Jamie out for cocktails after this. <laughs> so good, <Yay>. so <laughs> glad to be in this particular bookstore, living room slash whatever world we're in. But mostly I, Jamie and I first met when I was teaching the, for the first time at the Institute of American Indian Arts and she was an MFA student and she, the, I, right away, within 24 hours, I understood that everything that Jamie ever wrote was beautiful and was layered with a thousand different meanings and heartbeats and souls and that there would never be a piece that crossed my desk from her that didn't matter. And I also learned about Jamie that she makes every room she's in better. Everybody wrote better when Jamie was there. Her warmth is tremendous and her really, your just arms are so big. It feels like you have room for everybody. So I just, including me, I felt very lucky to be <laughs> gathered up <laughs> by you. And I'm so, so lucky to have you as a friend forever. So forever, <laughs> forever, <laughs> gonna be the best. So um, Jamie, let's hear your beautiful reading and then we'll get to talk a little bit and then we'll get to hear from all of the rest of you out there in the world. Absolutely. Thank you to Books Are Magic and, and thank you to all of those of you who are who are joining us at this very moment. And thank you to, to Mona. Um, I met Ramona first through reading her books, um, through um, A Guide to Being Born and No One Is Here Except for All of Us. Uh, I read them just before I was to meet her and furiously underlined and reread and, um, and uh, was just so deeply touched and honored that I got to be in her presence. And then that her presence was so tremendous. Talk about a magical presence. Um, so you have been one of the, the, the best gifts of, of my life and of my writing of life and of my, of my career. I'm, I'm, I'm deeply grateful for you in, in lots of ways. So I have to say all of that good stuff and could go on and on and on. Um, but let me let me read um, just a few pages, and I'm and I'm going to read um, from quite later in the book, actually, um, about the explorer. This is a, a this is a return to an earlier time um, when the explorer um, really comes to this this family, and so um, since he's part of the title, and I haven't really read about him yet, I thought tonight would be. Um, a good time to do that. So this is from the, um, so the novel takes place in three days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. This is from late Sunday, chapter 11. The explorer was the kind of man who, after pulling into the drive that first time, got out of his car and followed the mother and her children inside the house. Even though, mind you, there was no official invitation. The house took note of this. This was one of the explorer's attributes. He knew when to follow. Once seated at the kitchen table, he began to take inventory of what was not there. No curtains, no paint, no dishes, no pottery, no record player, no plants. Rosalinda, Rafa, and Rafina all looked around the kitchen and saw not what was there and had been there, but what had been missing all along. With the explorer's naming of what was not there, everything seemed to be lacking. Where were the curtains? Why didn't they have paint on the walls? Ursalinda had never felt so studied. Her veins seemed to swell in response. Her temperature became significantly warmer. She poured him a glass of water from the faucet, placed it in front of him. When the explorer's eyes paused from darting about the room, they landed on her. He was seeing her lack too. That was obvious even if he wasn't calling it out. Rosalinda's heart rate was excessive. You should know that what she heard in addition to the explorer's listing of what was wrong was the possibility of him making it right. In effect, what she heard was a list of promises. When the explorer said no paint, 
she heard that he would be the one to do the painting. That no record player meant he would be the one to locate such a thing, install it, and produce the records needed to fill the house with sound. And this way, she grew more and more excited as he continued with what was not there. Sewing machine, rugs, candles, tapestries, art. He didn't leave once it became dark. They continued to sit around the table, Rafa on his mother's lap, Rafina the closest she'd been to reaching out and touching the large carved wooden cuff on the explorer's wrist. Curiosity kept them pinned to their places. Who was this man? Where did he come from? What was he doing here? Finally, the mother said, if you're not going to leave, then you're going to need to sleep. I suppose, he said, his smile opening with all his bright teeth. Outside in the yard, there's a couch. His smile turned loose. He nodded. Dreams are best sleeping out there, Rafina said. Don't tell, Rafa said. He'll take them all. Will you, Rafina asked, steal all the dreams? I don't know how I could, the explorer said, when there are more than could ever be counted. That's not how it works, Rafa said, turning toward his mother, is it? Rosalinda did not respond. That the explorer seemed to have appeared out of nowhere and had nowhere to go, made Rosalinda feel a kinship with him. She was imagining the house filled with things. She was imagining him doing it. A man who could make things appear was a magician of sorts after all, and she wasn't so burdened with her own devastations that she couldn't remember the possibility of magic, especially when it was seated across from her. Will you leave some dreams for us? Rafina said, trying again. The explorer lifted the glass of water to his lips and emptied it without pause. Later that first night, Rafa and Rafina watched the explorer from the living room window. As he moved the couch so that it faced away from view of the house and managed a makeshift tent around it, Rafina bet Rafa that the explorer would never leave. Rafa bet Rafina that he'd be gone as soon as the rains came. The betting continued. Rafina that their mother would fall in love with him. Rafa that their mother would chase him off with the machete. Rafina that he'd become their father and they'd be a family. Rafa, that the memory of the explorer would become so small that they'd step on it like a cockroach and forget he had ever existed. Isn't it something how they both were wrong and they both were right? Oh, I love that. That's so beautiful. You know what I was thinking about as you were reading is how much this novel holds on to space that is outside of its own boundaries like that it is it exists over these three days in some ways it's very compact and yet it implies and sort of gestures toward all of history and the future too i was thinking about the history part a lot but then as you were reading i was realizing how much the implication of what's ahead matters just as much and that the there's a hope and a faith in the forward and in Rafa continuing on and in all of them finding a new doorway out of this moment of their lives. Do you think about time when you're writing, like where you are in the larger scope of space and time? Yeah, I like for it all to exist at the same time, which is problematic, right? Because you can lose a reader very quickly. You can you lose yourself very quickly when you're writing. <laughs> but that are pasts are in our present because they have shaped who we are, right? And they're informing us um, that our present, um, no matter how much we try to stay centered here, is sort of always tilting towards the future and towards we are, what we're dreaming about and what we're hoping for. Um, so how... Um, I guess one of the things that I think about when writing and when rendering characters on the page is how to make a fully flushed, fleshed out character and include these, these moments 
at sometimes it's passing, right? And it's just sort of lodged in the moment. And at other times I feel like we need to, as readers go to that moment and have that experience with the reader. So it's, um, I don't know, maybe it's a little, you know, uh, you know, a little bit piggish of me. <laughs> I want everything all at once right there. But you know, one of the things that I loved about um, studying with you, Ramona, is is that you were more than willing to encourage us to break the rules so, and take creative risk, right? Yeah. And like, go, 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 see how that works and see if you can make it successful. And so I, I so deeply appreciated that permission and that affirmation, which it actually is incredibly rare in MFA programs. And so I knew um, enough to know that, that, that it, was a, it was a highly valued experience that I was having. Well, thank you. But mostly, I mean, look at you. I could trust you. It was like, yes, Jamie, you should do that. You should do all of the things. <laughs> I think you can do this. Because not all of us can write a 200 page novel that's about infinity and <laughs> everything in it. It really does have everything in it though. And it, I feel like it's just this like incredibly stacked sort of geologic strata of feeling and experience and relationship and relationship to other people and to place and to the like deepest layers of the soil of the place and every life that's ever been lived there and the ghosts and angels and every possible, it, I don't know. It just feels like you've somehow pulled off this magic trick of not leaving anything out while also staying very, very focused. Did you, did you know, like, what was that process like? Did you know that that was happening or were, did, or there are moments where you had to make decisions about slimming things down or finding a kind of different focus? Um, you know, I think that for me, the process was, um, letting myself have the space to, to, to wander a little bit more. You know, I was so used to writing short stories, right? So that leap to writing a novel and that you can wander, you can have pages that necessarily don't lead to something um, was, a, was, I think was and still is a little bit um, mind boggling to me, even though I read it and appreciate it when I'm, when I'm faced with it myself on the page. Um, um, there is that, um, there's a little bit of that struggle. The thing that I also really love are compact novels that you can pick up in the morning with a cup of coffee and like spend Saturday with or spend Sunday with. And by the end of the day, when you're winding down and having your dinner, you have fully been immersed in another world. Um, and so I knew that I wanted it to, to be fairly compact. And also um, I just wanted every sense of beingness to be included, especially in the place. Um, and so, so that took, you know, that took some doing to, to sort of figure out how, how to do that and, and, and remain compact at the same time. Mm -hmm. Well, you did it somehow. I don't know how. It was very hard, <laughs> but it's very good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Can you just talk about how you started, how the very earliest little germ of seed of this novel? Where did that come from? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, someone very, very smart who was teaching me said, <laughs> that they had also been told when you leave an MFA program you know many of us sort of think oh we have our thesis Whew. um you know and I was told start your next work before you leave so you have that to hold on to because you don't know this is sort of my my addition you don't know what life has in store for you and so if you have that thing started you can tether yourself to it come what may and um, be more successful rather than leaving and trying to figure out how to start something and, and how that might make sense. So there was that. Um, and also just before, before that, so I think in 2014, I had been to Portugal, to Lisbon and had spent some time there reading those writers and, and, and experiencing that culture and also um, experiencing and hearing a lot about Saudade that really deep longing and melancholy that can never be met. 
And so that was somewhere in the back of my mind, right? Um, deep buried in my heart um, was that that notion that I had been steeped in. And then I had this sort of like, a, you know, like a shimmering, like how you would remember a dream. And that was how I saw the, the opening scene, the plaza, these two siblings performing. Um, so it was sort of like the memory of a dream, but the dream had never happened. Um, and then the, the language came, came with it and it was very, it was even more unruly. In fact, when some people read it and they're like, you can't, you can't do all of this at once because it's like, I'm still stuck on this one place that completely, you know, all of the languages wanted to show off as much as this brother and sister wanted to show off. And then they became a competition with each other. Um, so thankfully I, you know, I started that before, before we left and had about 20 pages of it. And, and then thankfully Stephen Graham Jones read it and he said, I don't know what's happening here. Sort of like my experience of it, but, but the language, I'm interested in the language and, and finding out where that goes. And so over the course of the next four years, I just held on to those pages and they delivered me from, um, you know, situations that were not in my best interest as a person and as a writer. And I think our writing can do that for us. You know, our, our relationship with our writing and our writing in relationship with us, um, it, can, it can definitely cross from the unseen realms into, into our lives and intervene. Definitely. I know, I think about that so much the way that especially with a novel, it takes years to write. So it's a, it's a life you're living at the same time that you're living whatever physical life you're living. And it follows you and the two are influenced by each other all of the time. I feel like a thing that happens in my day will, be, will explain to me something about, oh, this is how you fix that scene. This is how this part comes to life. And meanwhile, the novel's doing the same thing. It's like, the, it's, the whole, it's a window we're looking through for all of that time. And we're changing over those years and the book is changing and the life is changing. It's so, I don't know, it's just so big and amorphous and melding. There's no real distinction between the different factions by the time you're really in it. So what, can you say more about what was, how did, were there things in your life that you felt influenced what you were trying to do in the book or what you wanted from the book? Are there things the book was asking from you as a person? for to live in a way that the book could do what it needed to do? Oh, those are great questions. <sighs> yeah, you know that, um, that quality of becoming so incredibly quiet and so incredibly slow um, and so incredibly observant, right? As writers, we have to, to, to be in this practice. We sort of drift from it and come back to it. Um, but I felt like, especially with being in this place, being in this place of Santa Fe, the, you know, the, the Ciudad de Tres Hermanas is very much a fictional twin of Santa Fe with influences of San Juan. Um, and I couldn't, get too far ahead of myself in the writing and in, in being assumptive about place, right? So I think I had to continue to learn and relearn and connect and reconnect with a sense of this place and, and to do it in a way that was um, incredibly respectful, as well as rendering tourists and doing it in a way that, um, you know, doesn't sort of let them off the hook, but also is is respectful and, and kind. Um, that the book continued to ask me to um, to do that in the best way possible, even if I felt like I didn't have it or I had to summon it from a place that was unfamiliar. You know, it was. Um, I feel like in a sense, the book can be um, a sort of an activism. It, it feels also really political and it has a heart. And that heart is um, incredibly compassionate and inclusive. That really comes through, the, the very clear 
hard look at things that are complicated and that change people's lives, but also not completely turning away from those those people or situations um, or pieces of the culture and inviting them. I don't know, it feels like a kind of a gift, a real generosity that the book offers to ask people to see this thing clearly and to see themselves in it, a lot of us. I certainly see myself in that. Um, but to not say we judge you and you are a, you are bad, but like it just is. This is a truth, and you can look at it with us. Come in, come on in, and look. Yeah, yeah. I think that 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 quality of being taking that off the page into life, right, is uh, a teaching that I continue to to learn from. You know when in disagreement, when sort of in um, even distaste of another person for moments, how not to um, forget your own humanity and forget their humanity. Yeah. Very much so. I just had cute kids spy on me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're going to peel away all the layers of plot and movement in the book and get to the very, very, very center. What do you think that is for this novel? What would you say it is finally about? Sometimes we talk about it in my class as the black hole to which all other matter is drawn. So it's sort of like <laughs> this force that pulls everything else that's still active and alive in the work into its orbit. Yeah. You know, I think there's something about um, endings and beginnings. There's something about, you know, I think um, I think a lot about Michael Mead's work and just sort of mythology in general and, and, and mythologists who, who sit and stew in, in that realm and what they pull out from it to, to that's applicable to our times, right? And that, that, that the world ends. You know this so well because no one is there except for all of us. Everyone should read. I'm always like, everyone should read this book right now. And then it's the next year. And I'm like, read it again right now <laughs> because, um, because the world does come to an end. And what happens is we begin again. The world begins again. And so how do we remake that world? And I don't think we talk enough about that we are in the process of becoming again. You know, sometimes I think we're so fixated with um, sort of um, nihilism and, and, and the ending of all things and sort of what has meaning. And it's like, no, 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 no. Um, summon your creativity and your imagination and the world begins again. And I feel like that's the, the black hole of this book that the world ends and begins again. Um, that's so beautiful. It also feels like the book is trying to tell us that the world ends and begins again and we will bring with us a lot of that matter. We will use the matter from the old world to, to make the new world. So we have to do a good job because we have we have to, means we have to pay attention. It feels like the book is a is is asking for a lot of attention and observation and a really kind of careful, slowed down looking at what we have and who we are and what we've brought with us so that we can use those things maybe a little bit differently in the next part. Yeah. Okay, absolutely. now I'm gonna ask you a writery question to make sure we get one of those in and then we'll get Q and A in about five minutes. I'll see what, so get your questions in. I can't wait to read them. Um, so writing a novel is really hard, like really, really, really hard. <laughs> How, what are your lessons learned? What are the things that you know now if you begin another book that you think might help you or might help a writer beginning her first novel? Um, I think we hear this and it, it, and it means something different each time you hear it, right? Trust the process means that you're, you're in process, right? That you haven't abandoned the process and that, um, that you get lost. You get lost and that that's natural and it's healthy that you lose your sense of control, that that's natural and that's healthy and to stay in process and in relationship with what you're writing um, 
and to maybe um, to not to not worry so much about that. Um, you know, I felt like there were times when I I would literally hit the wall. I'm like, what happens next? Where are these people going? Um, you know, who gets included? What what matters? And often in those times, I learned how to get really quiet, get really still, and listen as if I was listening, you know, for my name being called, you know, two blocks over. Like there's that kind of weird, um, if you've had the experience, you know what I'm talking about. And if you haven't, it's really hard to explain, but it's almost, almost like you have a, as a writer, as an artist, right? There's that, you know, Marie was talking about divining rod, but I think it's like this internal antenna that you sort of point in the direction of where the material is coming from, which is both you and outside of you at the same time. And to just be receptive, right? Sometimes we're with our pen and we're just like, well, I write with my pen at first or it might be on a, on a computer, but like chasing after. And there's that kind of energy of chasing after and there is also really importantly the, the the pose or the position of opening, a softening, of being receptive and letting um, what needs and wants to come through you for you actually to be able to to receive that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So, do you have? How do you do it? Have you always been able to do it, to, to slow down and listen like that? Are there times where it's- No, it happened with this novel because of the spaces, right? Where you're like, I cannot, I don't, no idea. I'm, I am know if, it, if it's up to me, I'm sort of, I, I'm done. Um, sort of flexing as in my strength. I've reached the limit of my, of my strength here on the page. And so, um, you know, sometimes there's also a timing thing where you feel like you want to be done and that, in, or you only have so much amount of time in a day or in a week to work on it. And it's not going the way that you want it to. And there's this becomes this kind of push and pull or this tug of war experience. And I was always surprised when I could remember to quiet and to open I hope I'm not going to jinx myself. I'm like, where's wood? That's not real wood. Where's wood? <laughs> they would come. The next sentence would come. The next scene I would sort of flash, right? I was never without, um, without being met in those moments where I, um, where I really were, was receptive. Mm -hmm. And, and it didn't mean that later, right? If you have this experience, and I'm sure that you've had something similar, if not that exact experience, it doesn't mean that later that doesn't get edited in a way that, right? That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, um, you know, Robert Owen Butler talks about that, that dreamlike state, right? That sort of being in that sort of trance place where you're there, but you're not there because you're so consumed by this other world. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, and also I hear you saying that it's really a relationship that you have with this book, that you are talking to each other. And though some people describe the, like sort of like channeling or taking dictation, and I don't ever feel that sensation, but I do feel what you're talking about of, you've kind of conjured an energetic force and it, is, it begins to be a being of some sort and you are talking to it and it is responding. There is a, like a, a push, a, like, I, you know, it's just a, sometimes it's a crack and sometimes it's a sort of soft spot that feels like if you pushed on that, you might discover something. And sometimes it's like a sort of heat source, but you just have to keep, you keep, keep going there. And it does feel like the more you are actually in a relationship with the work, the more it will give you that next thing when you, cause you're listening to it and you're actually paying attention to what is, what that creature or force or I mean sometimes I feel like it's like a swamp monster living on my floor <laughs> I'm like what do you eat what do you want from me how can I make you less oozy <laughs> and sometimes it feels like it like rises up and I'm like whoa look at this it's like living here and it's warm and alive and cool yeah yeah and I think there's that thing where you sort of sense where the energy is and you learn how to follow that Right. right, exactly, exactly. 
Yeah. Um, okay, let's see. I'm gonna look at the chat and I've got more questions too. Okay, so that we've got a question from Lynn. She asks, are any of the major characters in this book based on real people in your life? Um, you know, I, I think sort of when we're sort of fishing for the standard answer in fiction, right? Where, where characters are sort of a composite of, of, of other people um, and they're also their very own. Um, and there's also um, almost like in a dream, you feel like each character is sort of part of you in a sense um in their own as well um i have to say that i was um fascinated by the brother sister relationship i am i'm the youngest of, of three daughters and um that just for so long seemed like such a strange combination to have a brother and a sister in a family it's actually quite normal and it happens all the time but especially seeing them as adults relating to each other in the in the world, um, sort of through my friendship circles, a number of different brother and sister combinations um, I, I got to know and, and also sort of passed through my my friendship circle. And I, I just was like, wow, that's really interesting to me. How does that work? Um, and so I was just sort of fascinated and, and, and spent some time with that, but that was a number of different sort of sibling pairs. Um, so it's not, it's not necessarily one. Um, yeah, so there's not anyone that I can point to and say, oh, this, this is a thinly disguised some other person. They were definitely combinations of, and also, um, and very much their own, you know, even if in the beginning I sort of thought, oh, this kind of feels like or reminds me of someone very quickly. Um, I couldn't continue to write into that. Does that make sense? It's like they have to be their own force, unrelated to any kind of, um, you know, momentary inspiration for the book to actually be what it needs to be and for them and for the characters to have their lives. Yes, very much so. Yeah. Danzy Senna, whose novel Caucasia, have you read that, Jamie? It's so good. I haven't read it yet. Um, but she, it's really, was, it's closely based on her family story in a lot of ways, but she talks about the point of departure that she had to take, where she made physically and emotionally and completely in every way she could think of the characters different from her mom and her sister, especially, because she couldn't, she's like, I can't, I can't write any farther because they are in my head as themselves and I need them to become in my head as other people so that they can actually get big enough in the book and I can sort of take them over. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But, but meanwhile, Santa Fe and Ciudad Tres Hermanas and the sort of like, sort of tropical version, the little bit San Juan version, <laughs> which I really like the idea of, I might move there. <laughs> that is really does feel like it's, it's a kind of twin. Was that, what did that feel like to write? Um, it, it felt safe, actually. It felt really, it felt safe to, um, to, to, to not take on an actual place, um, but to be able to say, um, I'm going to, to do my best to thread in and be the most respectful that I can and also have the freedom to, um, again, a point of departure, you know, so to speak, that was still needed um, with a sense of place is, is, is that we can become so restricted by what is. Um, and I feel like one of the things that happens with writing and especially with, with longer work is um, the question of what else could be possible. And so that means that I, you can't stick to any sort of essential likeness of person or place. It has to, um, like you're saying, get big enough for, for the, the imaginative expression of those. Mm -hmm. Right, and that this, it, it has to grow outside of its own boundaries. It has to become something that is, especially for a novel like this, that can contain the angel and the, the lives in the past and the lives in the future and the and all of the versions of themselves that they are carrying around with them. So the city itself feels like it is kind of the multi 
multi, I don't know, something, something like bristly and good and, and more alive because it doesn't exist in the world. Like there is already a Santa Fe and there's already a San Juan. So we don't need those. We need a new thing that can kind of like take stuff, energy from those and bring it up into the atmosphere. Okay, now we've got a good question um, from Serena. Books are magic. Um, so she's asking if you can talk about the unliving and how that operates in the novel. So there's spirits, there's the all of these kind of what we talk about as otherworldly, but really are very much part of our world too here. Mm -hmm. You know, again, I have to think about about your influence and teaching. Um, and I think you had us do an exercise. I could be making this up, correct me if I'm going on a tangent, but I just remembered having um, something very sort of um, ordinary, like a fork or a coffee cup um, and imagining that that fork or that coffee cup is also having an experience and they're also having an experience of you. And something changed in my <laughs> sort of circuitry of my brain through that, um, that, that, that I could explore that, that that was potentially valuable, that I didn't have to worry about point of view and, and oh, that can't happen, right? But absolutely it can happen if it needs to happen. So for example, the house, the house absolutely sees and feels and knows and comforts those feet that walk across its floor, how could it not? How could it not know, right? The hands that touch the knobs on the doors. That makes total sense to me. And it makes total sense to me for this work, especially. Um, but it just makes writing so much more interesting and also creating so much more interesting and story um, to, to again, notice perhaps what has been cast aside that is important for us to pay attention to. Absolutely. That when writers are, I have students who are trying to write something fantastical or magical for the first time, there's often the like two or three pages at the beginning of the story that justifies and explains this phenomenon perfectly. So they're like, I'm gonna, I promise, I promise, I promise it's true, it's true. Here's the reason. It's because of a tear in the space-time continuum and then this happens and you don't I if the answer is how could it not you just trust it you have there's a kind of faith in the magic or the strange or the otherworldly or the the I don't know resident other forces as true if you trust that they are true and you let them actually be themselves nobody has any questions anymore we don't need a justification we don't need the scientific reasoning because how could it not it feels like of course that house is feeling that. I don't need any, I don't need anything else to be told to me. Yeah, that sort of goes along with something else that I have to, to, to thank you for Mona, because within that space and within what you share as a teacher, um, some of what you were just talking about means that we get to trust our own authority. It means that we can um, perhaps find an expression of our voice that we haven't had the space, haven't had the support, uh, haven't had the trust, right? Because of whoever might be teaching us and their experience with literature and their own experience with writing and what can be and what cannot be. But to have someone in authority who's leading you, you know, say to you, I trust even if we're still in the midst of it forming itself within us, um, that does something. It does something that's really life-changing. It was for me with you. I'm so and I can't thank you enough for that. Yeah. Your students are so lucky. <laughs> I had that. I had that. And that's what I feel exactly <laughs> the same way. If somebody's saying, I just need to stay out of your way, you you just go and do that thing. We are here to hold it whenever you want, but you don't need someone else to give you permission to try that absolutely impossible idea that you just came up with. You could do, if you want to do that, you can do that and you will find your own way. No one else could know how that would work. 
Okay, one last question before we're done oh, from Lynn. What normally comes first, the plot, the character, the setting, or the reason? Um, the character, I think the character, and very quickly, the character in scene. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> the water, the water's going in the wrong direction. <laughs> Don't you hate it when that happens? Oh, water. <laughs> I can mute, that's handy. Like, that is you very can't handy. mute, you just gotta cough. <laughs> and then um, do you just kind of follow the character? I do follow the character and sort of, um, it's a combination of, of um, sort of asking questions. You know, not, not literally in my mind sort of asking them, but, but there is buried underneath this um, curiosity and this desire who are you? What do you want me to know about you? What matters to you? What happened to you? Um, show me how this goes, right? There is that um, being led through character. Mm -hmm. And that's that relationship too, just being listening and following and asking questions. Yeah.